So let's get started and let's welcome to the stage our keynote speaker, Nina Laaksonen. Hello, hi Sari. Hello and welcome. Thank you. So, uh, you have long been a messenger of agility, leading several agile and safe transformation in multiple companies. Where did you get your initial spark to enter the agile world? Well, good question. My, 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 my nature is such that I, I really dislike when things are not progressing or, or kind of when I see that things are done in an inefficient way. And, and I think uh, uh, Agile as, as such is really tackling these issues that, that bug me uh, personally. And I think Agile is doing it also with the human touch uh, in mind. So, so that's, that's why I, I got so excited about Agile. Great. So as, as it seems that Agile is in your blood, do you have anything else uh, in, in your life that you are doing? <laughs> I do. <laughs> so so they, ha having a family of, of three kids, of course, takes a lot of my time. But then uh, it was some five, six years back uh, when, when kind of I decided that if I want to grow uh, also as a person and, and, and uh, maybe be more straightforward also in my professional life, I decided that in, in my personal life, I need to step out from the comfort zone because that's what I'm preaching to people when I talk about Agile overall. So. I joined a, a group of ladies and, and uh, we are doing flow gymnastics uh, where you are able to really, you know, work on your flexibility and, and work on your, your focus as, as well. And, and with this awesome group of, of ladies, we have been able to, you know, travel in many places and, and been performing in front of, uh, for example, in Germany uh, on, on the uh, stadium of Berlin, uh, performing to Angela Merkel and 70,000 other people. So. This is what I do in my in my spare time, stepping out from the comfort zone. Okay, that's great to hear. I think it's now, now time to get started. So floor is yours, Nina. Thank you. And let me start sharing my screen and put the presentation mode on. Yeah, we can see your slides now. Good. So thank you. And, and uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nina Larkson, and I'm here today to talk about Agile transformation at scale. And, and I'm going to walk you through three different stories, um, which actually link quite nicely together. But they are three totally different stories on, on what Agile can mean uh, and, and what Agile at scale can mean. So I'll start by um, describing a kind of Comptel story, which is basically two Agile stories um, where we took a different approach on, on how we approach agility and, and how we approach uh, scaling uh, the agility part. Then I'll spend uh, uh, quite some time on the Nokia software story, which is a super exciting story on how we bring scale, uh, kind of really scale, uh, talking about thousands of people and, and, and thousands of uh, agile release trains with the, with the safe, safe language in there. And then, then the last one will be about Signant Health, where I work today. And, and, and this is a, a super exciting uh, area as, as well, uh, a very regulated area. We talk about health tech. Uh, we are uh, kind of in a business where we provide software to, to different pharma companies when they are doing, for example, uh, studies on, on how to get uh, the vaccine out for COVID-19. So this is, this is a super exciting exciting area and then I'll, I'll help you a bit um, understand the challenge we have there and, and how we are planning to planning to operate uh, in agile in, in a highly regulated uh, environment. But let me start with the Comptel story. Uh, so, so Comptel um, had been doing agile for quite a long time, more than five years. We were on, on kind of the scrum uh, level. And, and teams were performing actually quite quite well, but the business in, environment was changing. So uh, we used to be uh, a company where we had uh, two main business lines with about 100 plus uh, engineers in, in each of these two, two lines. Um, the market was taking us more and more from individual products uh, into solutions and solutions that required you know, collaboration and interaction between multiple of the products. 
So that meant that uh, what worked earlier when we were focusing, you know, one scrum team into one kind of part of the product and so forth, operating a bit more in, in a siloed manner, that didn't work anymore. So we needed to come up with a solution or a system in, in how are we able to work in, with this increased amount of dependencies across the different uh, products. But then also we had a challenge on, of, of having quite a long uh, feature lead times. And, and uh, we also had uh, um, identified that we had quite a heavy uh, amount of technical depth in there as well as, as we were so, so focused on, on getting functionalities out. So this actually resulted that we were constantly under high workload and, and uh, we had also constantly changing priorities, which meant that we were, you know, hopping from one, one focus area to the other one. And well, I don't think any one of you is surprised when I say that this resulted in quite unhappy personnel as well. And that's, that's not a good combination. So what we did was that we, we, we stopped for or paused for a while and, and, and started to look at, okay, where are we and, and, and what type of actions do we identify that we, we want to take to get us out of that, that, that kind of uh, situation in which we had ended up in. So we, we checked that uh, where we want to be is that we want to have a better possibility to react to the market changes. The market, we were in the telco industry, so the market was changing heavily fast. On the other hand, we also uh, noticed that, that kind of we are inefficient as a company. We are doing many things in, in a siloed manner, which meant that we were not able to identify the synergies that we would get if we would look at it more from a portfolio point of view and kind of more holistically in, instead than, than kind of looking component per component. We also needed to get much faster integration time between the different products and, and the solutions because the time to market was really key at that point in, in, the, in the kind of situation where Comptel was. And that required that we also need to identify the dependencies because dependencies are something that typically slows you down. So the actions that we identified, so how do we tackle these four main, main kind of uh, issues where we wanted to be in a different stage than where we are? So first of all, we agreed that we will start to have release planning on quarterly level. Earlier, we did that on yearly level. So we were going to speed up like four times uh, kind of how, how often we do the, the release planning. And by this, we really wanted to ensure that we are able to react fast uh, to the market changes. The other thing we, we said that we, we are going to do uh, is that we are going to look at uh, um, business unit level. So we're going to uh, bring in the visibility on the plan items by doing it uh, transparently, uh, by prioritizing the epics and really bringing it from kind of component level up to the business unit level. And then having full focus on the end to end development. It's not enough that we get one component uh, done because that's not what we're going to release to the market. We're going to release a full product or a full solution. So that's why we need also in all the development and all the testing and all the validation, we need to focus all the time on the end to end. And this, of course, requires that we need to have a closer planning and synchronization between the different teams. So we found safe. And, and at that point, it was safe 4.0. Uh, and, and kind of we, 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 we had the luxury of having these, like I said earlier, the two business lines. And uh, we, we kind of decided about the same time that, hey, safe is, is the one that we need. So it was not a company decision, it was a business unit decision that we, we wanted to go to safe. And, and we did so in basically two different approaches. So one of the business lines uh, started to, to kind of look more from up down, uh, so, so kind of that um, um, business line was uh, putting the focus on portfolio defi definition. So understanding what is the portfolio that we we kind of want to work on, what is kind of the or what are the different dependencies within that portfolio, and how do we manage those, identify and manage those dependencies, and how do we then set up that one backlog that we can prioritize so that whatever the asks are that we hand over to the development teams, they are always the asks that we know 
make sense at that specific time and are the ones that uh, where we will get the business benefits as well. The other business line uh, took uh, uh, the approach of more looking bottom up. Um, so with the facts at hand uh, uh, that we knew that we are not that fast and, and we are not able to get releases out as fast as we wanted. So um, that business line decided that, OK, let's focus on the team, team level. Let's ensure that they are very well trained uh, into the kind of uh, safe and, and very well trained also to scrum as such and, and uh, look at really identifying the bottlenecks in the development. Uh, part and really focus on, on getting the development efficiency uh, in there. So it was quite interesting to see that same company, same time frame, but two, in a way, totally different approaches on, on kind of the very same, same problem. And out of these, the approach number one uh, was the one that uh, kind of brought the, the kind of required results in, in a relatively short time frame. So, so this is looking one year uh, into the uh, um, kind of uh, launch of SAFE. So, so kind of when we looked at how many epics are we achieving uh, on a program increment level, so that had, had grown from 40% to 76. So quite impressive kind of uh, growth in, in what we were able really to achieve of the planned items there. Then on the other hand, if we looked uh, uh, on program increment level, when we counted up all of the stories that we had committed to. So in the beginning, we were spilling 71%, which is a huge amount of spilling stories. And we were able to cut that down to 12%. And, and I think that's, that's quite amazing as, as well. For me personally, being a people person, I think uh, the most uh, kind of satisfying thing that we got out of this was the, that the employee satisfaction uh, grew from 54% to 73. And all of this, when we kind of then went back to the teams and asked that, hey, what happened? They really said that now we kind of understand where we belong in the big picture. On the other hand, we understand uh, kind of uh, um, not only the short, short term, like two week sprint ahead, but then kind of they understood on a more longer term what's coming in and they were able to do more uh, proactive decisions also on team level. And then, then they also felt the empowerment that kind of teams were more and more asked and more and more involved in uh, the decision making and, and also kind of uh, in, in making commitments and so forth. So, so that's, that's kind of it, what you really see here in the numbers. And, and I'm, I'm quite proud, proud myself of being part of that story. So if I would summarize, what would be the takeaways from this? Well, I would say that really focus on the portfolio management and focus on ensuring that whatever you ask from an R&D team or, or the development organization, make sure that you, you have the priorities right. Don't go on that context switching mode, but really kind of put in a lot of effort on the portfolio management and, and getting priorities uh, kind of right up front and, and not while the development is already happening. And then the other thing is really the dependency identification and the management of those dependencies, because those are typical bottlenecks, like kind of every time uh, you have to stop your development because you are waiting for someone else, it's waste. And, and that's, that's kind of what you want to, to kind of get rid of in, in, your, in your system. And if you really want to, to scale, if you really want to be efficient, you have to have a good DevOps. You have to have a very kind of a coherent tooling as well, that then um, the whole, you know, organization that you are collaborating with, so they should be in the in the same tooling, tooling as well, because then that eases up a lot also the collaboration across the different teams. So this was was kind of the learning from Comptel. And, and then the story continues in, in such a way that uh, um, Comptel was acquired by Nokia, Nokia software, to be more precise. And, and we, we entered from being a, a kind of 1,000 person company into being part of a 100,000 person company. So we really kind of entered, entered the scaling part in here. And, and this is what, what, the, what it looked like a, a couple of years back when we kind of decided uh, that uh, we, we, we really need to work 
on the scaling part to really be able to to kind of get the benefit of having the luxury of having 6,000 software engineers within the Nokia software. We knew that we had uh, complexities in there as well. So we knew that we are operating in more than 20 locations. Um, we knew that we are, we are having kind of uh, more than 150 products uh, in our portfolio as, as well. We started to identify eight value streams. We, we knew that we are going to end up somewhere between 40 and 50 agile release trains. Uh, and about 10 to 15 so solution trains uh, there as well. We had uh, kind of an idea of, of um, working in, in around 450 agile teams. So you really kind of start to get that is the scaling. Scaling part was, was really, really in there. The challenge then at, at Nokia software was, was really, as, as you saw in the previous slide, you saw the magnitude, you, you saw the amount of teams, you saw kind of 150 products and, and uh, um, Nokia software kind of, the roots of Nokia software is really an end result of many acquisitions as well. So you understand uh, that being a product company, buying different companies and their product offerings, it also results in overlaps overlaps on the portfolio level. So how do you identify and how do you address those overlaps, but then on the other hand, also gaps in your portfolio? So that was one of the challenges that, that we were facing, facing kind of when we really started the, the journey on, on Agile at scale. Um, having 450 teams, uh, so you understand that there's a lot of dependencies, even that not all of these 450 teams will work together, but there are many teams that need to work together so that they get one product out or many teams that need to work together so that they get a solution out. So how do we manage those dependencies? How do we avoid the delays uh, kind of that, that are inevitable uh, for there to come? And, and then uh, we knew that, uh, again, being in the telco market, uh, the market is changing so, so fast. And we really knew that there are a couple of strategic uh, kind of uh, initiatives that we want really to accelerate with. They were the must wins. So how do we then plan and ex execute so that we kind of get these strategic features done when we knew that they will involve multiple solutions and products across the different, kind of across the, the one same portfolio? And, and how do we really kind of ensure that the requirements that we, we send out to the development teams, how do we ensure that they are consistent so that we really get the common functionality out from there instead, again, of having 10 different solutions for the same thing? And then when you operate on, on that big scale, uh, kind of talking about uh, uh, thousands and thousands of people, how do you work with the mindset? Kind of really ensuring that we have the lean and the agile mindset and not only in the development teams but across the whole organization and i think that was one of the main takeaways that we did during this journey is, is really that kind of agile is not only that you know uh, software developer thingy it's, it's really kind of something that happens and has to happen across the whole organization so the approach that we took uh, was that we, we kind of started to work on, on this LACE mental, mentality, so Lean Agile Center of Excellence, LACE. And, and, and we draw uh, a canvas on, on how does this organization look like uh, from transformation point of view, and, and then kind of identify that we want to drive that from a central uh, kind of Lean Agile of cent, uh, Center of Excellence. But then for the transformation itself, we set up it, its own kind of a focused group uh, that had then its own implementation backlog for the, the identified transformation topics. And, and kind of this was also the group uh, that was then providing uh, support when we were launching kind of those, those agile release trains, which you saw that we had the, the aim of, of getting 40 to 50 of them launched in a relatively short time frame. So it was about supporting the art launch. Uh, it was about coaching the existing art, so the Agile release trains. It was really also about providing and coordinating the training. You know, we had 6,000 people that needed to get this one mindset in place pretty fast. 
and, and then kind of uh, how do we provide the different processes and practices because an, an organization of that size like basically any organization you need to have some kind of uh, processes that everyone is following you need to have a practice also on different uh, guidelines and so forth so this was also the theme that that worked on those so in the picture you can see uh, these these kind of black bubbles uh, here around that we identified actually quite a number of different focus areas where we wanted to put put kind of special effort uh, uh, in the from the transformation point of view, if it was portfolio management or product management, we looked at the architecture, we looked at the different processes and practices, looked at the tooling, looked at how do we support the key roles of, of uh, a solution train engineer or release train engineer, but also identifying that it, it has to do a lot also with HR. Are we as an organization when we are recruiting or when we have bonus systems and, and all of these in place, is that supporting the agile mindset and so forth and so forth. Um, part of that, that kind of transformation canvas was then also looking really at the different uh, business lines where all those value streams, you remember we have had eight of them. So each of the value stream had then their own uh, Lean Agile Center of Excellence that then kind of went more into details in that specific value stream on how do we get uh, those uh, agile release trains up? How do we support the, the kind of backlog management? How do we you know, remove any impediments that kind of we face within that value stream? How do we communicate within that, that value stream? And how do we really provide the support and the coaching also for the leadership? And, and, and the different themes in there, because there's a lot of that you really need to do on the, on the mindset part in there. But that we tackle then through these value streams that then all were linked and, and kind of um, dotted line reported then to the central, central kind of steering, steering team there, there as well. But not only this, so like, like I said, it's, it's not only a software development thingy, this, this Agile, but it really requires the business agility. And, and this is something that uh, kind of we quite soon after kind of launching the different trains realized that, that kind of we, we have to look around us. We, we can't only focus on the product management. We can't only focus on the R&D. And at that time, kind of the Save 5.0 was launched. And I think that was the, the kind of... A, response to our our ask because that really brought up these uh, uh, seven different uh, uh, kind of skill sets that are important if you, you really want to uh, succeed if you are kind of working on, on the scale like we were uh, at Nokia software. So they were em em emphasizing and bringing in tools on, on kind of not only on the lean portfolio management or the organizational agility. It also looked at the continuous learning and the culture that you need to have in place. How do you work on the agile leader, leadership in order to really support the agile mindset and, and, and how do you really kind of lead the change there as well? Then it had these most traditional kind of things as well as the team and technical agility, agile product delivery, and, and then kind of when you really work on scale, you need to think about the enterprise there as well. And I think the beauty here was, and something we valued really a lot uh, in, in Nokia software was that it was really about the customer, putting the customer there in the, in, in the center. And how do you, you know, foster your organization so that you can really be an organization that supports uh, the customer in the best, best possible way. So what we did about a year ago uh, uh, in the Nokia software was that we, we did this business agility assessment. And, and you can see here the, the result of it. And uh, kind of the aim is that uh, this that looks, I don't know, like a broken star or something, it should be actually a, a circle, a neat, neat circle, uh, but it isn't. And uh, in, what we found was that we were really, in a way, good at uh, how do we work with agile teams how do we lead the change and how do we have the customer there in in the in really the, the focus but then the areas where we were more weak uh, where then the how do we work on the agile business operations or how do we coordinate across the different trains and the suppliers that we had plenty of uh, how do we kind of really do the governance part in such way that that also is lean and supporting this overall agile mindset that we were 
fostering? And how do you work on the people operations? So then a couple of, of next steps were identified and, and which the team then continued uh, to really push for was the decision making and, and ensure and that the governance is also simplified. And then really coaching and learning for those new skills and having a, 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 that mindset again of that continuous improvement across all of the product domains. And then uh, uh, increasing the visibility with different metrics uh, and, and ensuring that those metrics were coherent uh, across the organization so that we were really able to identify the areas where that were kind of uh, requiring a bit more, more effort and, and focus. And then collaboration, I can't enhance collaboration uh, enough, how important it is that, that kind of all of the different functions collaborate. So the outcome of the first year uh, uh, in one of the uh, product lines that consisted of one solution train and three arts was that they were able to see an, an increase year on year uh, on the business capability throughput uh, if they compared on how much one full-time equivalent where it was producing value. And they, they could see an increase in the commitment accuracy. They could see a significant reduction in the feature cycle time and then also in the fault leakage, uh, and then also um, the, the kind of hardening period, uh, kind of from when they were doing monthly releases. So they could see that they actually were able to, to make it up to half uh, the, the kind of length of that hardening period. On the other hand, kind of the negative side was that uh, the number of open faults as this, this specific time when we were taking out these numbers that had increased 18%, which is of course not something we wanted uh, to do, but that there was a, a good kind of explanation behind it as we were in, in the middle of, of kind of really um, deep diving into defaults and, and kind of uh, putting them on hold for a while to ensure that we are Kind of verifying which of them are valid and, and which which are not but i think really nice nice kind of results uh, specifically on the speed uh, aspect which was one of the, the kind of key things we, we wanted to see coming out there as well so if i would summarize the takeaways from this story is that kind of you really need to ensure that all the parts uh, are, and, and all the levels in the, in the organization are really into the change and when you work at the scale like Nokia software, you really need to understand your portfolio and you need to understand how that portfolio, you know, comes live through the value streams. And you need to have to ensure that this kind of portfolio thinking is there and that your organization is set up in, in such way that it supports your portfolio thinking, but then also your governance structure and the model in, in how you kind of steer and uh, and work with your uh, portfolio has to be there. Super important is to identify the bottlenecks and then kind of think actively think about how, how do you remove the waste, so the waiting time uh, that, that these bottlenecks are, are then bringing in. And communication, it really is key. And, and I think one of the learnings we, we had when we were so focused that on, on the transformation itself and, and you know, as engineers, we, we always, you know, identify that, okay, this is not working, this is not wor working, we need to work on this and that next. So, so we, we, we got lost in the translation ourselves as well and forgot about celebrating success. And I think this was one, one kind of aha moment really for us in the transformation as, as well, that we are doing plenty of really super, super stuff and, and we start to see a lot of uh, improvements and, and kind of benefits coming out. But we were shy about, you know, sharing that with, with the broader organization. So, so we really kind of then realized that, hey, be proud of what you're doing and really share the success and learn also from the failures. And if I would summarize this with, with kind of, you know, one sentence, it's John Cotter and John Cotter's change management principles. That's what kind of this is really, really kind of all about. So then the, the segue to, to my next uh, um, uh, kind of challenge in, in my, my kind of career was then that I, I, I moved over from Nokia Software to Signant Health, uh, which is uh, about 2000 people a company uh, working in, in the um, health tech uh, environment. So, so what we do is kind of our main business is to provide software for pharma companies to support 
the different clinical trials that they are they are they are working with. So the situation at Signant Health or, or the challenge that we are currently working with is that we are in a situation uh, where we are uh, past uh, a merger. So, so there were two strong companies that were, were kind of merged uh, together. Uh, we are a private equity uh, owned company. And two companies coming to together, two companies with, with different uh, culture, different level of agile maturity, different scale on the development organizations where one part of the organization can have a product that is developed by a team, you know, one scrum team. Uh, other parts of the organization can have a product developed by 20 uh, scrum teams. So, so there is quite difference in, in the scale uh, of the development organizations within the, within the company. We, we are using different tooling. Uh, so all the, all the way from, from conversion control to backlog management tool. And it's, it's, it's different, which is understandable to, to companies coming, coming together. And then it was set up that let's, let's harmonize. And, and kind of we were aiming for full harmonization across all of the different functions and tools and, and, and just name it. And, and at the same time, we are in a, in a business, business that is undergoing a lot of technology transition. So, so these kind of cl clinical trials is, is an area where many of it still happens by using pen and paper. And, and what we are introducing is, is an electronic tool, basically software, through which uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, pharma company is uh, discussing with the patients and, and collecting kind of data on, on how the patient feels and, and how, how he or she reacts. Uh, to, to the medicine that they are investigating for, for a certain disease. And when we are talking about people and people's health, it, it is highly regulated. And, and that, that puts in its, its own flavor uh, into the game as well. So, so what we are really working on is, is to get that kind of one company culture, uh, get, get kind of the, the kind of different uh, toolings and these in place. And, and then also uh, enable that uh, at the same time when we are harmonizing, we also have a challenge of, of moving uh, kind of or, or taking the next step in the technology uh, area there as well. So what we have done is that we have, we have now looked at the transformation more broadly and, 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 and take it down into phases. And, and kind of the, the first phase, uh, I think, is, is what this this slide is, is trying here to summarize. So we, we had five main things where we wanted to focus. So first of all, the vision and, and kind of here clarifying from for ourselves as well that what is important now and what is something that we can do later on. And what what is the area where we want really to focus now? And then we want to you know pause for a second, inspect and adapt and then expand into the uh, kind of direction that makes sense in, in there. But really what we need to have is a really, really good vision and then work towards that one. The governance part is another thing where we know uh, that we can improve and need to improve if we want to be agile uh, in, in this uh, kind of uh, domain in which we operate. So we need to strengthen the, the steering meetings. We need to strengthen the collaboration between the different stakeholders, uh, both uh, within the company and then also uh, uh, external uh, from the company. And then be much be better on timely and fact-based decision making as well. On the tooling side, uh, what we identified is that we, we need to have one backlog tool in order to have that prioritized backlog in place that uh, you know, was one of the takeaways from, from my time at Comptel and my time at, at Nokia Software as well. On the other hand, if we really want to ensure that we have uh, a good um, uh, ability to fast uh, kind of ensure that we develop and, and test and validate, we need to put focus also on having good test management tooling and having that again harmonized across the company. And, and of course, version co uh, control there, they're on the same, same note. And then the visibility and predictability. So how do we work on the road mapping process? How do we work on it really with the agile and, and kind of this incremental development in, in place? And that requires, of course, the backlog prioritization and the constant grooming to be there and, and really kind of a, a, a super close collaboration between the product management and the, the kind of R&D teams there as well to get the two-way communication and feedback cycle in place. 
and in order for us to be able to make those fact-based uh, and uh, timely decisions, we will then uh, focus on introducing some key metrics uh, that then we will run across across uh, kind of the, the company in order that we get really the understanding on where we are and how are we progressing against the target. And last but not least, the built-in quality. Uh, so this is where the regulation part comes in. The regulation is is, is quite uh, uh, strict and, and there are certain certain kind of topics that we really need to do in a certain order. But is that kind of uh, um, how much is it mandating us to work in a specific way? I think there's a, a lot of room for, for kind of improvement and a lot of room for innovation there as well. And really to switch from, you know, let's validate last just before the release to going really into that test first approach and, and going in with the, with the built-in quality mindset. And I can't emphasize enough the importance that across these five uh, kind of focus areas, the key is really in engaging the personnel. This is not something that can be dictated top down or bottom up. This is something that involves us as, as a whole company, which means that kind of we need to have everyone on board. So to summarize the takeaways uh, uh, kind of that, that, that we, are, we are now having at Signant and, and what we, our aha moments is that we need to start by clarifying the big picture. We can't, you know, go in and start to work on the details first and then, you know, just magically end up into a big picture. But it really needs to be the, the other way around. Clarify the goal first, clarify the big picture and then start to work, you know, backwards from there on, on what are the different steps and the details that you need to have in place in order to meet that, that big picture or vision. And uh, don't try to harmonize everything. So work in phases, uh, kind of work focused and, and kind of get one thing done first, then kind of uh, uh, evaluate, was that enough? Move to the next one, work on it, evaluate, and then again, move to the next one uh, in, in the order that makes sense. And focus really on, on, on the essentials, essentials first. So that means that you need to identify what the essentials are in order for you to be able to focus on them, them first. And then the people, engage uh, kind of the people early on, really kind of make them feel important, make them feel empowered, make people feel and understand that uh, it's the people that make this a success, not the process itself. It's really the people. And communicate frequently with the people. Everyone wants to know, everyone needs to know also in order to be able to play, uh, you know, the same game. And, and in order really to, to be able to, to kind of provide their input and focus on, on getting the, the end result in place. So with, with this, I, I kind of uh, want to conclude my presentation. I, I hope you got uh, some insights in, from three different agile stories that uh, kind of all, all in a way are different, but there are a lot of commonalities between these as, as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. And uh, we are having a lot of questions in, in questions and answers, but I think we don't have so much time to go through them, but let's start and let's see how far we get. The first question is, how did you conduct the business agility assessment? So this is referring to Nokia software. And how many re people responded? How did you choose who can respond? How long the assessment took and so forth? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. We could spend another half an hour <laughs> discussing <laughs> discussing that that one. But what we did was that we we utilized the tool uh, that the Scale Agile framework has has built. Uh, we were one of the first uh, organizations that that run run that one, so it probably has evolved uh, since since back then. Uh, we took an approach of of doing uh, the first round as as a focused one. Uh, so, so we had uh, some key roles uh, identified that were then kind of responding to the to the questions, and then later on we were planning of expanding it more uh, to cover um, a broader amount of people uh, in there. I don't anymore remember the numbers uh, on, on how many people we had responding, but we we started off with the, with the more focused uh, on on selected uh, key roles to be responding into it, that uh, kind of uh, assessment. Okay, very good. Then the second question goes, uh, what was the role of the product owners or product managers and how was their training approach? And I, I think this is also referring to Nokia software. 
Yeah, and it's the same for all of the three companies, really. So, so kind of the 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 thinking here is that um, the product manager and product owner they are two two kind of separate roles. Uh, product manager is is really kind of the the person who sits with the responsibility of the profit and loss. So, so I, I try always to simplify it in in such way that the product manager is really the external facing uh, kind of person. Who understands uh, kind of the business and, and kind of um, has the vision on where to take the product and, and then is, is kind of transforming that into a roadmap. And then the product owner is then more a team facing role uh, where kind of that person is translating into technical requirements, the business requirements that the product owner, sorry, product manager is, is pulling out from the, from the market. So the product owner works very closely uh, with the team uh, on a daily basis and, and kind of uh, uh, operates closely with the, with the architects or with the UX designers and, and then with the team itself. And of course, with the product manager uh, kind of there, there, there as well in the symbiosis, uh, so to say. Okay, and maybe one very quick question uh, at the end. So here was the question that defines spilling stories. Is that like scope creep? And that was from uh, spilling, yeah, spilling, yeah, spilling stories in, in that, that metric that I showed. Uh, it was a, a committed uh, work item. So in a, in a kind of sprint planning or in a program increment planning, uh, there was a commitment from the team that yes, we will take this and we will finalize it. But then for a reason or the other, they were not able to close it uh, during that given time frame. So then it's 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 a spilling item. Thank you very much, Nina. And if you got uh, any further questions, just uh, go back to the uh, speakers table where you can see Nina and the rest of the speakers. Thank you. Okay. Next, we will have have a go for as a as a sponsor talk. Anton Schuberg will share with us the sponsor talk. Do we have Anton joining on the on the stage? Hi there. Hello, Anton. Thank so you. you have now five minutes to share the go for store story. Cool. Cool. I'm going to see if I can share my slides. I had problems with this, so let's see. Uh, share screen. No, it's, I guess it's not working. No, you I, have can't my, see. I think we've got my deck there, right? Okay, let's see if we can get them shared. Yes, yes, go. we can. Cool. Okay. Great. So, yeah, uh, thanks for this. I, I, I want to give. Uh, just a bit of an update, really, on uh, on on what good what uh, go for are up to at the moment. Um, I've got five minutes, so I've got six slides. I'll see if I can get through this. I should be able to. Um, we go for us took a really interesting position now in the market. It's uh, it's it's our brand promise is to pioneer an ethical digital world. And uh, I've I've joined Gopher quite recently to kind of work out what that means concretely. So if we're talking about ethical and we're talking definitely about sustainability, uh, so what does that mean and how do we offer that to our customers? So we've come up with this thing called Go for a Good Growth, uh, and you know you can guess what that means, but I can I can show you a little bit now briefly. It's kind of the opposite to bad growth. Uh, so good growth uh, really is about you know defining you know making sure that we're we're, we're building in sustainability. But I, I wanted to also like talk a little bit about how we're sort of using agile methodologies in within good growth to make sure that we deliver on this. I think just for me, sustainability is very important and an urgent kind of need, and customers are asking for it. So I guess you know using some of the agile kind of philosophies and principles, and that will help us to kind of achieve that. Can we change the slide, please? So essentially, it's two things. Good growth is a way of working. It's a model. It's a process. It's, uh, you know, you imagine all of us that go for it, you know, working in this way. And it helps us to ensure that we're building sustainability into the, into the project work that we do. And uh, 80%, nearly 80% of our work is through public sector work. So it's a really great platform to do this with. Uh, in Finland, with all the private, with all the public sector services, but also importantly, it's also a way to measure the impact. 
So we're working now with our tech technology expertise to develop a model for measuring that impact. So at project level, we're setting, we'll be setting KPIs around good growth. What does that really mean? What's the concrete KPI? And then, you know, managing that data and actually then, you know, using that data as insight, but also using that data as kind of, you know, communication to be transparent about the sustainability impact that we're actually having. Next slide. <clears throat> Um, do you want to change the slide, please? So there's, there's three things that we look at in good growth. I'll just briefly cover them. Uh, and, and these are kind of like the fundamental lenses. One, in, our, in one way, we, we have been looking at people in business quite a lot, you know, uh, in, in the way we work. But we've included nature lens here. So we, we, these lenses help us to make sure that whenever we do a project, uh, with our customer that we are addressing all three lenses here then that what that's what for us what creates the measurable good growth okay next slide <clears throat> um, and we, we're developing a process and the process is for a number of reasons i think you know this kind of sustainability work is multidisciplinary it's often it often involves very kind of systemic sort of problems that include lots of different stakeholders so we're, we're trying to unify a way of working so everybody can come together around a unified way of working and 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 have to share the same experience and share the same kind of you know methodology and tools and i think for us it's a formula to help repeat the success on good growth projects so we can take this formula we can cut and cut and paste into different types of projects and different types of clients but ultimately it's really it's a flexible model so if you go to the next slide the flexibility comes in in the way we've kind of designed the, uh, the offerings of good growth. So you can see around the process, we have a bunch of activities, collaborative activities that we, we can, when we work with our customers, we can choose which ones, you know, we want to use. We don't have to follow the whole thing around. We don't have to use everyone, but we can pick ones that are the, are the most relevant for your particular business and your particular challenge. Uh, and then we can, of course, try new ones that you might not have tried before. And then we can also string ones together that um, make sense for that particular project. Next slide. And then finally, uh, if you take to go to take the next slide, thank you. Uh, so this, you know, is where the kind of agile stuff. I think we're trying to build because we already work in a very agile way. So we're building a model that you know uh, works with that. And you know, because of the. I think Agile is great at kind of like getting stuff done, you know, you know like uh, without kind of hierarchies and, it, and it's really about kind of delivering and, you know, evolving that delivery as we go. And I think that's the real, that's the way to approach sustainability work. You know, there's no point in overthinking. The most important thing is just to get going. So I think that's why we've took this model and the way we've designed it is to be kind of self-organizing and definitely cross-functional with multiple stakeholders involved for this kind of work. And then the adaptiveness of the model where we can pick and choose relevant tools and methods for that particular, uh, for that particular project. And then we've got this um, idea around the evolutionary aspect where, you know, we get stuff to market as fast as possible and then work with the metrics and work to continuously improve the, 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 the products or the services that we've developed. So, so we're, we're trying to build a lot on the agile on the agile principles, and I think it makes a lot of sense going forward in this in this kind of work, and especially in the way uh, work is developing forward. You know, it's all about you know ma making impact as fast as possible and and getting stuff out there. So that's kind of that's what we're up to. Go for. I hope that I hope that makes sense. Um, and you'll see more coming from us in the coming months. This will now. Be kind of launched publicly in uh, in the next couple of weeks, and uh, we'll be continuing to develop it with our customers and uh, interested people. So, thank you.